Newborn Care Part 2. This is a beautiful picture of a normal newborn infant. You can see the uh, flea bite or air rash on the baby. Sometimes they will have little red areas. Sometimes on the face and head they will have markings if a, uh, particularly on the back or the occiput of the head or, or on the top if there were uh, kiwi or vacuum extraction used to uh, assist or it's called vacuum assisted delivery was done. You also may find some places sometimes on the head usually not over the fontanelles it shouldn't be but over to the side and in the back sometimes it's caught in the hair where the uh, internal fetal scalp electrode was um, was applied. Um, sometimes if it's not taken out carefully or gently there can be a tear on the on the babies on the infant's head usually neosporin or some type of erythromycin will be put on that but the pediatrician needs to be notified um, we always in previous uh, slides I talked to you about nasal flaring and it's very subtle sometimes and then sometimes it's very obvious where the nares uh, flare out with each respiration and that's a compensation method that the, the infant is using to try to get more oxygen in by flaring out and usually flaring is associated also with retractions um, and grunting as far as respiratory distress in a newborn. But this is a beautiful baby and you see other than they're wanting you to see the head and the hair but other than that, the baby needs a cap on the head to conserve heat because a lot of the heat, uh, the majority of it, the head is the largest surface area of, of an infant and they lose a lot of heat through the top of their head. So that's the reason we put a stockinette cap or a hat or something on the baby's head to help conserve that energy and that heat. Uh, and you can see the baby's wrapped in two blankets and should always, a newborn the first day or so of life at least should be wrapped till they're able to kind of, till their thermostat kicks in and they're able to regulate their own temperature, you should um, wrap them in two blankets. And from then on out, you, you know, uh, after a week or so, you know, you dress the baby according to how you, you are comfortable but always feel of the baby's torso, not the hands and feet. Okay, let's talk about uh, chest and chest shapes and, you know, uh, the chest, uh, it appears circular since the anterior to posterior, uh, the anterior, posterior and lateral diameters are about equal. The chest is slightly uh, smaller than the head and usually 12 to 13 inches. The main thing on the baby's chest is that we need to assess the clavicles for any fracture or anything broken during the birth experience. The babies that it's most common on that this would happen are large for, gesta large for gestational age babies, uh, infants and infants of diabetic mothers, gestational diabetic or, uh, or chronic diabetic moms. Um, they're going to get more of the sugar during the pregnancy and they're usually larger infants and so they're more at risk. Anytime you have a difficult delivery where a shoulder's hung or you have what's called shoulder dystocia where it's the head comes out, the baby's head just kind of bobs out and there's a turtling sign. The head comes out and it tries to come out further but the shoulders are holding it back. And so it goes in like a turtle coming out of its shell and then pops back under the shell. And that is, uh, if that's seen, then you really need to assess clavicles. If you think they're broken, the physician may order or the uh, pe pediatrician may order an x-ray. Uh, you also look for symmetry of the arms. Do both arms move? Do they flex and, you know, and extend both, uh, both of the arms because if, if they have a brachial plexus injury or they have a broken clavicle or there's something wrong with one side, they're going to look different. It's going to, you're going to see asymmetry. One arm will be moving, one won't. Uh, when you do the startle or the moro reflex and startle an infant, one arm will 
move up and in a C curve, the other one will do nothing. It'll be flaccid and laying by the baby. Um, protrusion of the sternum, the xiphoid cartilage is common because in really thin babies it's just right there and it sticks up. Um, respirations appear diaphragmatic. Um, so I say babies are always, they appear to be abdominal breathers or they breathe from the diaphragm. Uh, bronchial sounds are heard on auscultation. They should be clear. Uh, nipples are prominent and often edematous in infants, uh, both male and female. The larger the breast tissue, the more stippled, the more breast tissue there is there, the more mature an infant is or the older in gestational weeks or age. Uh, the smaller they are, therefore, the more premature. And so, um, some infants, especially male infants, may have witch's milk or uh, a milky secretion um, that will be seen leaking from the breast tissue. Uh, it can be male and female, but I usually see that more in males. At term, the infant has breast tissue mass of about 5 millimeters or more, and 5 to 10 millimeters of breast tissue is considered a, you know, kind of on, a, on the term or post-term side of things. So the more tissue they have, the more mature. If it's only, you know, uh, two to three millimeters, then, you know, they're, they're less mature. The heart rate is very rapid. Those of you that have assessed the heart rate of a newborn, if they're crying, it can be 160 or greater. If they're mad and screaming, if they're very quiet, it can be around 110, 120. Uh, prior to delivery, you need to be watching the monitors and know what the fetal heart tones have been running, and that's what you would expect once the baby's delivered. Uh, and it fluctuates a great deal with changes in the level of activity from quiet to crying. So it's going to be, you know... Uh, less if they're very quiet or if they're in a restful state, they've been sleeping. And if you find a quiet infant, make sure you assess lung and heart sounds and count your heart rate uh, at that time before you do a temperature or anything to upset them or make them cry. You can listen so much easier. You do need to use a neonatal or a pediatric stethoscope. It makes it easier and kind of confines it to that area. Uh, all of the units, you know, nursery and labor and delivery have the little neonatal stethoscopes. Um, the heart rate, you need to tap your finger, your foot, you need to move your finger with the, with the beats. Uh, you have to do something to keep the rhythm and to keep your count up. Just try to block out all other sounds and count only the heartbeat and then you count for a full minute always. Um, anything greater than, you know, 170s, 180s and above is tachycardic. Below, you know, 110 or 100 is bradycardia. Okay, the abdomen. Infants' abdomens, uh, the main thing that we're assessing is, you know, you want to assess their, their bowel sounds and the uh, gastrointestinal system, but um, you're looking at the umbilical cord, and we want to make sure that the umbilical cord is clamped with a cord clamp, that there are three vessels there, and initially when a, a, an infant is born and they're placed under the warmer, sometimes we end up being, we're the ones that actually cut the cord and clamp it and make sure that you don't get any skin tissue around the, because the cord may be uneven in places. It has three vessels in it, two arteries and a vein. They're held together by Wharton's jelly. And some uh, cords are very, very thick and some are, are real wimpy and small and uh, look unhealthy, like the mother maybe didn't, you know, her nutritional status was not good, she didn't eat properly during the pregnancy, uh, the baby's real small, uh, and that could also mean that, you know, if there were problems with the cord. 
um, that you know the baby may not be as you know as developed or there was some intrauterine growth restriction or something because of uh, issues with the cord. <coughs> Their abdomens, infants abdomens are slightly pr uh, protunded or, or uh, they're round and it should be symmetrical. The abdomen, abdomen moves with the chest during respirations and there may be visible bulging at the midline of the abdomen. There's a gap between the rectus muscles called the diastasis recti and no masses should be palpated in the abdomen. If the abdomen looks distended, measure you know, abdominal circumference. And in most all hospitals now, we do an abdominal circumference on admission. So if there are problems later, we can go back and reference that. So we do head, chest, at nipple line, and abdominal circumference uh, right above the umbilicus or the cord and length and weight. Uh, the umbilical cord should be midway between the xiphoid and the symphysis pubis uh, and is inspected for two arteries and one vein immediately after birth. Um, if you only have one artery, it's associated with congenital anomalies. Uh, anytime there's a problem with the cord, the placenta and the cord are going to be sent to pathology. Or if you have a baby that is a fetal demise or that there's uh, some kind of um, congenital anomaly with the child, then they will send the cord. Because sometimes there are problems, there are infarcts in the core, in the uh, actual placenta. There's uh, problems where um, there can be true knots in the cord, there can be uh, defects in it that would answer or tell you why there was uh, some anomalies in the baby. The cord should be clamped uh, for at least the first 24 hours after birth. Uh, typically we leave it on till right before discharge. Uh, so if vaginal deliveries, they stay two days, then it stays on until right before discharge. And three days for C-sections. Uh, the clamp can be removed when the cord is dried or it's uh, occluded and it's um, closed off, sealed off. Um, triple dye in some hospitals is applied uh, initially for cord care to, uh, to minimize uh, microorganisms and to promote drying. And then alcohol is usually used after discharge. At the facility I work at, we use alcohol the whole time. Sometimes that triple dye or gentian violet, all of these things uh, have uh, an antibacterial effect to it. Cleaning with alcohol, you know, does. But um, the main thing is to keep it clean and dry, to keep the diaper turned away, turned down away from it. Uh, to make sure it's not inside the diaper where it's staying moist from urine or that it can't be open to air and kind of dry out. But you teach the parents to clean particularly with alcohol around the stump. Everybody wants to dab it on top of the, the cord clamp or just dab on at the end and that's not the part we're concerned about. We're concerned about it being crimped off and closed and and occluded. And if parents ever notice any bleeding coming from the cord, you know, from the cord itself, they should, uh, you know, notify the nurse or take the baby back. If they're already discharged home, they should take the baby back to the emergency room if it's a significant amount. But if it's just a drop, you know, they also need to pay attention to cleaning around the stump where you're wanting it to dry off, and that's actually what makes the umbilicus or the belly button. Uh, the cord usually sloughs off in about seven to nine days. Absorb, uh, observe the cord for any signs of bleeding or infection. It may look, um, they may have an area that looks like an umbilical hernia, which is a protrusion um, in the skin, and um, it may slowly disappear. Um, 
it's not uncommon for especially African American female infants to have uh, umbilical hernias and there may be a protrusion there and in like uh, regardless of what infant it is they're going to just see if it resolves on it uh, on its own if it is a severe case then they may have to do surgery uh, they usually wait till later um, and see if it will resolve itself Normal bowel sounds can often be heard within 15 minutes after birth. So we check the abdomen where you're, you know, palpating for distension and for any masses, and we uh, listen for bowel sounds. The, one of the first things we do is we check the patency of the anus. You want to make sure that it is not sealed over or occluded or closed off, and we do that by doing the first temp rectally. Make sure you use lubricant and that you hold the thermometer in place. Uh, the other thing that we're looking for for patency and making sure the GI system is intact from, from mouth to anus, and that is the passing of the first meconium stool. And we would like for that to happen within the first 24 hours. If it's longer than 24 hours and the baby and the infant hasn't passed us a meconium stool, then we get concerned. So many doctors will do it, uh, pediatricians will do a digital exam. They will uh, try to dilate the anus if there's a problem there, but usually doing just a rectal temp is enough to stimulate uh, the meconium stool to pass. The bladder, the infant's bladder, uh, is another thing in the abdomen that is of concern and uh, they should have the first voiding should be documented uh, indicating that the urinary system is functioning properly. A foul odor uh, of urine indicates uh, infection. The first voiding should occur within 24 hours also. Okay, the genitalia, male and female. Um, sex of the infant should be clearly differentiated. So on birth, if it's ambiguous, then there's a problem. Uh, and that needs to be brought to the physician's attention and, uh, and the parents, you know, that would be a decision they would have to make if there's, uh, and, and probably testing done and all, uh, if there was ambiguous genitalia. It's not often that you see that, but it does happen. Okay, female, the labia, uh, the labias, the labia majora and minora are edematous, and the clitoris can be enlarged. Um, there may be a presence of uh, a thick, white, cheese-like, cheesy-like mucousy uh, discharge called smegma present. And pseudo-menstruation is possible, that's blood-tinged mucus. Uh, hymen tag may be visible. It usually disappears within a few weeks. And then in um, the thing that uh, kind of upsets or uh, would concern parents would be if they found like a pseudo menstruation and uh, on their little girl's diaper, and you would just explain that that's a normal occurrence. Uh, a lot of this edema of the breast tissue and the genitalia, and all comes from the hormones leaving the infant's body, and that's part of what causes the pseudo menstruation. In the male infant, uh, uh, the prepumis or foreskin covers the glands penis. The scrotum may be edematous due to the hormone effect. The meatus at the tip of the penis needs to be assessed to make sure it is in the center, uh, that it is not hypospadious or epispadious, that it's not, uh, that it's centered and that it's, uh, that the infant can void. Um, the testes should be descended uh, and you need to, uh, Cover the inguinal canal when you're palpating and assessing to make sure there's a, a test a, that the test, testes are descended one in each side of the sac. 
uh, and you assess those separately. Um, if, it, if the infant is really, really cold, we usually do all of our assessment under the warmer, but if they're really, really cold, the, the testes will uh, retract when they're cold. So we also need to assess for any hernias or any hydrocells in male infants. The spine, you look at the appearance and look for any anomalies. So what we're checking for here is the spine straight, about the posture of the infant. When you, when you drape them over your arm and let the head lag to some degree, then you need to um, see how flexed the baby is, make sure that at the neck that there's no openings, and also at the fork in the road or at the bottom of near the, the buttocks and all, that there are, is no tuff of hair, that there is no mole, that there's not an area uh, of deep dimpling that looks like it may uh, not be completely closed over. Um, you're looking for any signs of uh, occult spina bifida, which means it's not obvious. Uh, there may be a little piece of skin over a dimpled area, and it may not be completely closed inside. Uh, if you have on, on birth immediately, I mean, if you have a meningocele or a myelomeningocele, and there's a huge sac, and part of the spinal tissue is on the outside of the body, that's not hard to identify. But it's the occult or the kind of subtle things that you need to pay attention to. Um, you make sure that the chin uh, can be flexed on the upper chest, that the arms and the legs are flexed. Um, you're wanting to look for tone in the baby. Is there any uh, the degree of hypotonicity versus hypertonicity? And it's uh, in it may be indicative of a central nervous system damage or something. And so the infant spine is assessed for dimples, masses, tufts of hair, and any kind of spinal curvature like scoliosis or uh, if the, and you know, that's more common in females, but uh, you check both, both male and female. Okay, extremities. Uh, you're looking for symmetry, and we're talking more the legs and the hips. Um, gluteal and popliteal folds or creases of the hips are uh, normally are symmetrical on both sides. The hips are examined for uh, dislocation using Ortolani's maneuver. And if the skin folds appear asymmetrical and there is a limited abduction, or movement away from the midline, then further evaluation should be done to rule out the possibility of congenital hip dysplasia. Uh, the extremities um, are assessed for any extra or missing digits, any deformity. You also look at palm or creases. Um, if you just have uh, one transverse line linear uh, crease in the palm, that's associated with Down syndrome. It's called a simian crease. Um, and you're looking for pulses also. You need to check brachial pulses and checking for any diminished uh, femoral pulses. Uh, the term for um, some of the um, polydactyly is extra digits, and uh, you also look for any webbing of the fingers or the, or the toes, so look at both fingers and toes, make sure you don't have any extra digits. Um, and syndactyly uh, may be uh, hereditary, so we also need to look at that, and some families will tell you, oh, well, I had an extra digit when I was born, or, you know, and the, the only issue with that is if there is no bone in it, it can be tied off with uh, suturing material. It will just be tied around it, 
and it will become necrotic and fall off and there's not an issue but if there is a, an extra finger or extra digit and it has a bone in it then that would be an orthopedic consult or concern um, herbs palsy is damage to the brachial plexus and you need to palpate both femoral pulses at the same time unequal pulses may indicate a heart defect or the coarctation of the aorta um, you're going to check um, range of motion of all the extremities and your joints and all make sure that the baby can move look at the infant for uh, symmetrical movements making sure the baby's not jittery shaking tremoring has any signs of um, of seizure like activity um, infants usually uh, they will uh, put their if you put your finger in their palm they will grasp around it and hold on uh, many infants will have uh, their fists will be uh, clenched you're looking also at the legs for any um, any curvature like bow leggedness and all um, you're looking at the feet to see if they're clubbed or if it's just positional from where the baby was laying against the side of the uterus sometimes it is a positional thing it's not a permanent uh, condition slight tremors in an infant could be a sign is you know very common and a sign of hypoglycemia but if they're tremoring and very uh, have a shrill cry and very difficult to console then those infants uh, it's probably there's a possibility it could be a central nervous system problem or drug withdrawal because shrill cry and uh, shaking or tremors are signs of drug withdrawal um, you need to assess for uh, the possibility of clavicle fracture and palpate pulses, the radial, brachial, and femoral. Um, when you're assessing for uh, hip dysplasia, you want to make sure that you're not feeling uh, the bone come out of the acetabulum, that you're also feeling for a hip click or you're listening for a hip click and feeling to see if you feel the uh, the hip displace itself and that's what the next slide shows this shows uh, about uneven popliteal or gluteal folds see how the baby is asymmetrical and next slide shows uh, doing Barlow's maneuver where here is the head of the femur the acetabulum and this is where you know it should be does it pop out of place and so Barlow's is a maneuver that can be done where you're putting your hands on the, your fing thumbs on the knees there but your that your fingers are over the uh, the acetabulum or over the head of the femur and you could feel it if it pops out of place this is uh, showing an actual infant with club foot this is not positional if you can move it and it's just soft tissue and it's not uh, a bone thing then it may be uh, the way the baby the infant was positioned in utero and has been laying for nine months and um, and it will just take time for those muscles to relax and um, this is showing a nurse doing an assessment of a foot that appeared to be a club foot and she's actually positioning the foot correctly and so sometimes you know it's not an orthopedic or a bone thing um, and it's not a permanent thing it will just uh, take time for that baby to relax and and to learn to move those muscles in the foot a different way because it's been trapped or in that same position in utero so you really have to assess uh, 
Next slide is body systems assessment, uh, document your assessment findings, and then go from there. If you need to, if something you view as abnormal, then you would notify the pediatrician. But urological assessment um, is done to determine the, the intactness of the infant's nervous system. It is important to obtain baseline information on general behaviors, including resting posture, their cry, the quality of muscle activity and tone, and the state of alertness. Infant tremors are common, however, they must be assessed to make sure that they are not uh, that they are in the normal range and are not convulsions or seizures. Infant seizures may consist of excessive blinking, chewing behavior, or motions, um, or swallowing movements. So they may be more subtle than in an adult. Uh, whether the infant's spontaneous movements are smooth or jerky, or whether both sides move equally well are significant evaluations. The lack of good muscle tone may be due to uh, central nervous system immaturity. And so uh, you want to assess the child's development from head to toe cephalocaudally. Uh, the head size is proportionately larger. It's the largest surface area, so that's where they lose most of their heat. Infants have primitive reflexes, such as Babinski's reflex is positive in an infant. You stroke the bottom of the foot and curve around with your stethoscope, your finger, or a tongue blade or something, and the baby's going to fan out and flare out. In an adult, that's abnormal. Um, in an infant, it is normal because they're... Uh, Positive Babinski's is normal because of their CNS immaturity. We've already talked about assessing font nails. Uh, you're going to measure and graph head circumference, assess movements, look for any jitteriness. It could be just mild jitteriness, could be hypoglycemia, so we would need to do a heel stick on the baby to assess that. Marked tremors or seizures could mean uh, CNS damage or uh, drug withdrawal or the fact that the baby has drugs on board. So if you're seeing seizures and tremors, the physician definitely needs to be notified. But they probably more than likely are going to order a urine, uh, you're going to bag the baby to get a urine drug screen. Uh, you're assessing uh, infants for lethargy and for the pitch of the cry. And a high-pitched cry is a sign of uh, damage to the central nervous system or drug withdrawal. In this film, this slide just shows head control. Head control in an infant, A, inability to hold the head erect when pulled to a sitting position. And we wouldn't expect this at that time, but the baby does pretty good with trying to do that. And B, the ability to hold the head erect when placed in a ventral suspension. So the baby's not lagging extremely, uh, is doing a pretty good job. And that signifies neck muscle control, I mean, you know, the strength of the neck muscles and all. But we do need to uh, remind parents to make sure that they don't carry a baby like a sack of potatoes, that they hold the head up and that they support the back and the neck and the head because they can't do that for very long. They'll bobble and, you know, and they just don't have that support because the head is the biggest part. It takes really strong neck muscles to hold their head up and all. Um, and that will come with time. Neonatal reflexes. All babies, if you put your, they should have a, a suck reflex. Now, some have a wimpy, weak suck reflex. That's going to say that they, they don't really have this suck, swallow, breathe thing down pat. Uh, most uh, infants, as a rule, do not learn suck, swallow, and breathe until they are 36 weeks gestation. And so some babies are just a little further behind and they just don't get, whether it's breastfeeding or bottle feeding, they can't suck, swallow, and breathe very well. So some of them are 
uh, lethargic or kind of lazy and they suck they don't suck well what you want to do is put your gloved finger in their mouth and see if they close around it and actually begin to have a good strong suck uh, rooting reflex you tap or stroke the side of the cheek or uh, and whichever side if you're stroking on the right side the baby will turn toward that finger or toward you in an effort to latch on or to nurse they're hunting food or hunting a nipple in order to nurse and you want to assess you know swallowing is a normal reflex we want to make sure the baby can swallow and that they don't aspirate the first thing that we give them tonic neck reflex and I think I've got some slides on this is the fencing motion these are just um, normal reflexes and in your book you'll see pictures of these uh, Palmer and planter grasp means that if you put your finger in the palm of the baby, it'll clamp and grasp around it. It will do the same thing on the planter surface of the foot. It will try to curl its toes around your finger and hold on. The Morrow reflex is, um, I call that the startle reflex. And pull to sit reflex, Babinski uh, sign is positive and that is on the planter surface of the foot. And then I'll show you a slide on the stepping and walking. That's primitive uh, behaviors. I want you to notice here that there is obviously, even though this is a large baby, this is the thermostat or kind of the uh, temp probe, the skin probe, and it should go on the abdomen uh, always on top so that it can reflect the radiant warmer, which is up above and regulate the temperature. That's the only reason you would have a hyperthermic baby is if you overheat them or overcook them under the warmer. And you can see this baby has its uh, identification band on. At most hospitals we do one on the ankle and one on the wrist. They have two bands on. This baby has been here a little while because even though it's got some dye on there, this cord is already drying up. So this baby is several days old um, that's actually in this picture because that's that looks really dark and dried up. Um, this picture is showing a baby if you hold them up and, and act as if you're going to drop them or kind of move them suddenly. If you bump the crib and startle them, they will do the Moro reflex. And even this, though this baby's large, um, it's obvious that the clavicles, the brachial plexus is intact, that there's no damage to the arms or anything because this is symmetrical. But can you see the C curve that the fingers make when you do this startle? This is all part of it. The baby flexes the legs, everything comes up, and their arms go up symmetrically, and they make the C curve, and their fingers flare out because they're scared. They think they're going to be dropped or they're going to fall or, or a noise has frightened them. And this again, you can see the C that's made with the finger and the thumb. And the C there. And this baby is, uh, a, again, has a band on. Severe, according to this picture, acrocyanosis. The hands and all are much darker and the legs uh, more purple than the, the pink here that you're seeing centrally. But this baby is doing the Moro or startle reflex also. Flexing, you know, the more flexed a baby is, the healthier it is, but this is just a normal primitive reflex, the Moro or startle reflex. If I take uh, a tongue blade or my stethoscope or the end of a uh, reflex hammer and I curve around on the planter surface uh, across the sole of the foot up to the toe then you're going to see the large the great toe go forward and the little toes are going to fan or flare out so dorsiflexion of the the great toe and then fanning of the toes and this is normal in infants, abnormal in adults. Plantar grasp. 
This is the tonic neck or fencing motion that we talked about that was shown. So this arm goes out. If you uh, lay the baby flat and you turn their neck one way, they're going to most always go in this fencing position or this uh, tonic neck position. Sorry. And this is uh, called a dance reflex. On the slide, it's a stepping or walking. If you put the, uh, a newborn infant, if you place their feet on a hard surface, they're going to try to move them or act like they're mimicking walking or stepping or dancing. It's just interesting to see what, uh, what newborns do. And again, on this infant, I think he's had some scratches to the face there, but he's got a little, looks like a little air rash. Um, maybe just a little lanugo or fine downy hair, not much hair on the head. Ears are pretty, very, uh, look at this, they're not, uh, well, it's hard to tell from this angle, not low set, I don't guess, it may, um, you're checking the outer canthus of the eye, that the ears are not low set. This baby's already got a pacifier, so that's not a good thing if it's breastfeeding. What is, um, what this slide is showing is if you put the baby on their belly and give them tummy time and all, this baby's trying to push off and acting like it's, this is a crawl reflex, acting like it's wanting to get on its all fours and actually crawl away. And it is true, there has been a uh, documentation of this for years and years. There's some old videos. If you place uh, a brand new baby uh, cut the cord, clamp it, and put it on mom's lower abdomen after birth. That baby, uh, over an hour's time, the video showed that the infant actually does crawling motions till it makes its way up to the breast because it can smell the mother, smell the scent, smell the breast milk or the colostrum, and uh, actually latch itself on that that's possible if it's un uninterrupted and all that the infant can do that. This is showing uh, Palmer grasp. This baby looks a little mottled and cold to me. And this is an older baby because the cord's already uh, dried up and come off and they're just cleaning the stump at this point. But that's a Palmer grasp. Thermoregulation is very, very important in infants. We want the baby to have you know, the room not to be extremely cold where they are or extremely hot. Some families, once they get them home, if it's in the winter and all, they want to overheat the babies because they know that they, you know, have trouble maintaining their temperature. But we want it to be a normal, good temperature for the infant and always check the torso of the body. But remember as far as thermoregulation that infants uh, never say never, but infants are not supposed to be able to or cannot shiver. Uh, I told students one day that infants didn't have, you know, couldn't cry real, real tears and all, and they do, they can. And I, I, that very day, this child was stuck, and they, and the these big old crocodile tears were coming out because the baby was so mad and angry. Usually they just cry and they're in fuss and all, but they don't cry a lot of, you know, tears like we do. Um, thermoregulation. Temperature regulation of the newborn is maintained by balancing the amount of heat produced with the amount of heat lost. If the amount of heat lost exceeds the amount of heat produced, then the body temperature will fall. Well, that's pretty common sense. It is difficult for the newborn to maintain a stable body temperature because it has such a large body surface area in relationship to its weight. So the newborn's normal position of flexion and being flexed, remember I said a flexed baby is a healthy baby, and one of the reasons is that flexion aids in the thermoregulation by minimizing the body surface area exposed to the environment or the coldness of the room or drafts. So that flexion helps the baby stay warm. Newborns do not shiver to produce heat. Newborns have brown fat deposits that uh, produce heat. 
and so heat is dissipated through vasodilation. Their skin is thin and blood vessels are close to the surface and there is little subcutaneous fat for insulation. And so this is, these are reasons that the baby has trouble regulating its own temp. Uh, prevent heat loss. Uh, we want to prevent heat loss due to evaporation. And everybody, you know, there's, there's four types of heat loss uh, due to evaporation, radiation, convection, and conduction. And you need to know these for test purposes because this has been tested on before. I mean, you know, why do babies lose heat? How do they lose heat? And so a lot of this is pretty common sense. Uh, wet surfaces are exposed to air. So when the baby is born, it comes out of the fluid that it's been swimming in, the amniotic fluid. The baby's bloody, it has vernix, and it has, you know, blood and, and amniotic fluid on it. And so the baby, it's like you stepping out of the shower and into a cold uh, room. And the baby begins to, to evaporate, and it loses heat that way. So that's the reason we must get the baby under the radiant warmer and begin drying and stimulating the infant. Um, so you want to prevent heat loss due to evaporation by keeping the infant dry and well wrapped. Two blankets and uh, a stockinette cap on the head. Uh, you want to prevent heat loss due to radiation by keeping the infant away from cold objects and outside walls in the room that, you know, wherever the room is that you're taking care of them. And sometimes that's uh, been, you know, that's an architectural thing with hospitals. Sometimes we have that convenience and sometimes we don't. But you do want to keep the baby, uh, prevent heat loss due to radiation. Uh, loss occurs from a warm object to a cooler object, to, uh, from a warm object to a cooler one, and with objects not in contact with one another. Okay, so make sure that you don't put cold objects on the baby and that we keep them away from, uh, you know, outside walls and um, keep them kind of centrally. If you've got a mother, you know, her bed's usually in the center of the room. We pull the bassinet or the crib over near her bed so that it's not right by the door or right by the outside window or something, um, particularly in the winter. Okay, prevent heat loss due to convection. Loss of heat from the, uh, from the warm body surface to moving cooler air. Uh, and the way we do this is by shielding the infant from drafts. So here, convection, we don't want the baby to be next to the door where it's being fanned and opened and closed or have a ceiling fan right over the baby if it's, you know, if it's cool because they'll lose heat from convection. Uh, prevent heat loss due to conduction uh, by performing all treatments on a warm padded surface. And so loss of heat to a cooler surface by direct skin contact. So make sure that you uh, have the baby under the radiant warmer, not laying on something cold that whatever it's laying on is warm. We also want to watch the room temperature. I know mother is hormonal and she's hot, but we don't want the room to be too cold for the baby. Um, make sure that you're warming your stethoscope and objects because uh, that you're placing on the baby. So warm your step, the head of the stethoscope or whatever, your hands, if they're cold, before you, you know, touch the baby. So make sure you read about this in your book and you understand. Uh, axillary temperature protocols, the first temp is rectal and after that we do axillary. Just make sure that I put mine uh, long ways along the baby's uh, side and drape the arm over. I don't uh, stick it through 
the arm because the tip of it could be out the other, on the back side of the baby. So anyway, I do it long ways um, down beside the baby. And sometimes they don't like that. But make sure that the armpit is dry, that you've not just rubbed it or caused friction, but that it's dry and not moist, but that you secure the baby. And they may not like that pressure or you holding their arm down, but it's not going to take but a second. Okay, sleep, sleep periods. Sleep, you have a first period of reactivity, you have a period of inactivity or rest, a second period of reactivity, and a stability phase. So knowledge of behavioral stages helps promote uh, parent-infant attachment and feeding. Parents just need to watch their babies and learn about their sleep cycles. But you as a nurse or a nursing student need to know the newborn is in a state of quiet alertness during the first period of reactivity, and that's right after birth. His eyes are open and alert and respond to stimuli. The infant's heart rate and respirations are increased. The newborn can focus uh, attention on the parent's face, remember in that in position, and focus on, the voice, on their voices. This phase is followed by a phase of active uh, alertness. And during this active alert period, the newborn infant demonstrates a strong sucking reflex and may appear hungry. And it is an ideal time to initiate breastfeeding. So usually the first, um, the first hour after delivery, and sometimes we have the baby all during that time doing assessments, but we try to get the baby as soon as possible while they're still alert and reactive and not sleepy to the mother so she can breastfeed. Um, the first period of reactivity facilitates the bonding and attachment of the parent to the infant and the infant to the parent. Eye-to-eye -eye contact can be promoted by delaying insertion of the eye medication or the erythromycin to the eye until the infant can interact with his parents, uh, his or her parents. And parents should be given the opportunity to hold, cuddle, talk to their newborn during this period. After about 30 minutes, the newborn becomes drowsy and will fall asleep. And I feel like it's more, uh, you know, uh, an hour after the initial birth, and, and it varies in every infant. The infant is uh, becomes sleepy and unresponsive during this time. The period of inactivity may last from two to four hours. And after the sleep period, the newborn enters the second period of reactivity. This period may last four to six hours. Um, the infant is awake, alert, and may cry. So if for some reason the mother does not get to breastfeed or get to bond as well because she's had a C-section, because C-section mothers won't, they will just see the baby if they've had a spinal or an epidural, and then the baby's whisked away to the nursery because they're going to, the C-section has to be, you know, they have to be closed, and then the mother goes to the PACU or the recovery room. So she's not going to get to see her baby in a reactive state until maybe two to four hours later, depending on when the baby wakes up again, and then she will get to bond. And so definitely, when this happens, she needs to bond the second reactive time. Um, the infant's awake alert and may cry, and the newborn shows activity such as rooting, sucking, and swallowing, and appears hungry. The newborn may demonstrate eye-to-eye -eye contact at this time, and feeding may be initiated if, it, if you weren't able to during the first stage. 
and then from there there on there's a uh, stability phase uh, the baby sets its own pace it's waking and all and a lot of that depends on if they're bottle or breastfed breastfed babies we feed them on demand they're usually fed every one to three hours bottle fed babies uh, the formula holds longer and kind of keeps them satisfied longer um, and they're fed every four hours typically. Okay, behavioral states is next and you have deep sleep, light sleep, awake, quiet alert, quiet, uh, active alert, and crying. And so six states of consciousness or awake, awakeness are common commonly observed in the newborn infant. Reactions vary as, to the as the infant passes from one state to another. Most infants move smoothly between these states. The sleep states vary from deep sleep to irregular light sleep. When the infants are in deep sleep, their eyes are closed, there is no eye movement, breathing is regular, and there is no spontaneous activity except to a startle response if the infant's scared or the crib is bumped. An attempt to arouse the infant may be met with frustration. In light sleep, the infants have their eyes closed, however, there you can see underneath their eyelids there's rapid eye movement. They have REM sleep. They're going through the ring sleep, and they have the rapid eye movements. Eye movements may be seen through the eyelids, and random movements uh, with occasional sucking can be seen. And this is the best time to test the infant's hearing is when they're in light sleep to do the hearing screening. The, uh, the awake states include drowsiness, that semi-dozing, quiet alert, active alert, and fussing to crying. In the drowsy state of awareness, the infant is sensitive to stimuli. He sucks, smiles in his sleep, uh, seems um, makes smooth movements. In the quiet alert state, the infant has a bright look and can focus attention on sources of stimulation, both visual and auditory, with uh, a minimum of motor movement. This is the best time to test the infant's responses. The infant can focus and follow a red ball. This is an ideal time for parent-infant interaction and for them to play and get to know their baby. During the active alert state, the infant has considerable body movements. They begin wiggling, moving around, and the heart rate increases. The eyes are open, but less bright and less attentive, but, the, uh, and, but infants are consolable. When the infant is in the fussing or crying state, reactions to stimuli are often violent, and the infant can become very fatigued. This is the reason mothers are encouraged to pick up their infants when they cry, not to put them in a crib and let them just cry it out and and uh, and learn to you know to uh, kind of soothe themselves. In some cases, we have to, but many mothers, there are mothers who will just leave the baby there, and that baby doesn't learn that trust and all. That tr that's where trust versus mistrust. If you're left and not taken care of and all, especially in neg negligent situations, parents need to be advised that it may take some time to calm an infant once they're in this crying and frantic state. So it's better to try to calm them down and keep them from getting in such a hysterical state. Okay, we do need to do pain assessment on the infants, and we have a scale, you know, and we use facial grimacing and crying and what the baby, what the infant looks like if they look distressed, their face, because they can't tell us. We can't hold up a card and say, rate your pain on a scale of zero to, you know, five. Zero being no pain, five being the worst imaginable. You have to look at the baby. So how can you assess pain? Well, you, uh, you can assess it through change in vital signs, through behavioral changes, the baby drawing back, flinching, uh, screaming, uh, 
and you also need to treat pain. So like when a baby has a circumcision done, we give uh, sucrose or uh, to the baby orally. We know that sucking is a comfort measure, so the baby can either suck on the gloved finger of the nurse or on a pacifier if they're not breastfeeding. Um, we know that there are non-pharmacological pain relief, swaddling, cuddling the baby, rocking the baby, and non-nutritive sucking, which means to put your gloved finger in the mouth and let the baby just suck on it, and that relieves their stress and tension when they're going through an IV, uh, a circumcision, any kind of painful procedure. And also, quiet environment helps soothe and uh, helps with pain management. As far as pharmacologically, on really sick babies, like the NICU babies and very premature babies, if they're on a ventilator, they will medicate them for their size and by weight with morphine, fentanyl, you can also use Imla cream, like on uh, on the site for uh, an IV where the baby's going to be stuck, or over the penis for the circumcision. Imla cream is put on with an occlusive dressing, like a tegaderm or uh, trans uh, uh, the tegaderm dressing, or an opsite type dressing, a transparent dressing and is wrapped around it, but Imla cream does not work unless you leave it on for 20 to 30 minutes prior to the procedure. Uh, so topical anesthetics can be used uh, for circumcisions. We'll talk about that. They can do a lidocaine block where they actually do a regional block of the penis. Uh, and then Tylenol uh, can be given uh, orally, PO, uh, to infants. But if an infant is uh, not taking any PO feeds like your real premature ones, they'll have an IV and they will have morphine or fentanyl or something that is sedating for them. Uh, this is all of part two of the newborn. Thank you.